If you have your Bibles, we're going to read from the book of Luke 24. And I want to start at verse 28. Luke 24, 28. And we're going to read down to verse 35. Amen. When you have it, say amen. The Bible says, And they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, he took bread, and blessed it, and brake it, and gave to them. And their eyes were opened. Say that with me. Their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way. And I want to focus on this last phrase and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. For the next few moments, I want to preach on this subject, made known in the breaking of bread. Let's lift our hands one more time. Jesus, we come before you, Lord, humbly. God, we understand that there's nothing we could do to deserve your grace. Lord, you have chosen, Lord, in your mercy and your love for us to reveal yourself so that we might know you. And we are ever grateful for that this morning. So we pray this morning, God, that every heart would be open and every spirit, Lord God, receptive to receive this word. And that we would leave this place, God, with something new. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In 2016, I mentioned briefly how my family and I moved to a city that uh, didn't have a church ever. We were the very first apostolics in that city, and we moved without knowing a single soul, had no contacts, and... uh, started services in our living room, just the three of us at the time because our son hadn't been born yet. But uh, to boost our confidence, we also counted our puppy Coco in attendance, so we had four. Amen. She seemed to enjoy the services. She never did want to get baptized. She was deathly afraid of water, but the Lord is working on her. We spent about a year meeting people, making contacts, people would come and go. But there was a shift that took place in our second year planting this church. We one day decided to go uh, to the city building to inquire if there was anyone that we could talk to that could direct us towards some kind of project, some way that we could get involved somewhere in our city and uh, be a blessing. So we went to the city building and they introduced us to the director of social development, which would kind of be, you know, like social services. She oversaw, she was an elected official in the department of San Jose where we lived, and uh, she oversaw the programs for social development. Well, this region that we moved to was in the middle of six departments in the southwestern region of Uruguay. A department is what a state would be to the United States and uh, close to a million people in the entire region. So we were right in the middle of that, just our little family and Jesus. Amen. So we met this lady, and we told her, we're here, we're pastors, we're opening up a new church, and uh, we just want to be a blessing. Is there anything that you might need help with that we could, we could offer our, our services, we could offer our time? So she directed us to these places called merenderos, and a a merendero is a place where they eat what's called a merienda. Now, the British 
were in Uruguay for a long time and they left that custom of the afternoon tea. And so Uruguayans is part of their culture. They've adapted it. They call it the merienda. And it's from about four to six every day. It's that, it's a snack, tea, coffee, mate, something else they drink there. Um, they'll have a snack and that'll hold them over till dinner at about 10 o'clock. They eat very late. And so these merenderos are put in underserved and impoverished communities. And they're specifically for children who don't have access to food at home or access to you know, the right amount of food at home. And so the government places these centers in these areas for these kids to come. And many of them, it'll be their last meal of the day because, as I said, they don't, a lot of them uh, don't have a lot of access to food. So we started going to these, these centers, volunteering our time. We would uh, hang out with the kids, play games, draw, color. Uh, play soccer in the streets with them. My wife would sometimes bring a curling iron and a comb and she'd give hairdos to the little girls. And we just had a great time with them. But at four o'clock every day, the rush would come. The one employee that actually worked there uh, would bring out these large baskets of bread. And they were tiny individual loaves of bread, kind of about the size of a dinner roll. And so the kids would come and they'd get a loaf of bread and they'd get a cup of warm milk and they would all come in at one time four o'clock that's when all the kids from the neighborhood would come and it was just complete chaos this place this little tiny place would fill with these kids and they would all be told to stand in line and wait their turn but they never would they would all come rushing to the baskets at once and reach in try to grab that bread and and go back to the table, but many times before they even got to the table, they, will fin- they, they would have finished their bread and put their glass down and continued playing. So we'd been doing this for a while, and um, Easter Sunday morning, 2017, I was waking up early in the morning, the, the sun was filtering through the curtains of the room, and I was in that state between consciousness and unconsciousness, you know what I'm talking about? clearing the cobwebs. You're coming to, but you're still kind of dreaming, but you're awake at the same time. It's that that spot that's kind of difficult to explain. But in that moment, I heard the last verse, the last phrase of this verse, how he was known of them in breaking of bread. And this all happened in a moment. I heard that verse And in my mind, I saw myself behind that basket, extending my hand that had a loaf of bread. And I saw a tiny hand reach toward it. It was so incredibly detailed. I I could even see the dirt under the the fingernails of that child's hand. And, And they reached toward the bread, and as soon as they grabbed it, I felt the Lord speak to me, and I woke up instantly. And God said, this is how they're coming to know me in San Jose. Jesus is made known in the breaking of bread. We see a pattern in the New Testament. In all four of the Gospels, we see the miracle of the loaves and fishes. And every time we see this, we see the same pattern in the narrative that Jesus takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it. Amen. At the Last Supper, Jesus gathers his disciples around to eat the Passover meal, and he also takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it. And also in the book of Acts, Paul is in a storm, And after the winds die down and everyone finds themselves okay, Paul takes bread. He blesses it, breaks it, and gives it. Something's going on here that the biblical authors, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, want us to understand. And this is how Jesus reveals himself in these four acts of breaking bread. Now, of all the evangelists, of all the writers of the Gospels, John is the only one that explicitly makes this connection. 
And in the miracle of the loaves and fishes, we see what only John records. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He said, your fathers ate of the bread of life that fell from heaven. So John wanted us to see that what Jesus was revealing about himself as he took that bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it. What he wanted us to see was that this was the same God that provided manna for his children in the wilderness. You see, John understood that Jesus was revealing himself in the breaking of bread. When Jesus gathered his disciples at the Last Supper, he said, take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Now realize they were eating the Passover meal and one of the, one of the integral ingredients of that meal was the lamb. But when Jesus shared this Passover meal with his disciples, there was no lamb on the table, only bread and wine. And as he took that bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them, he said, this is my body. In other words, he was revealing himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He was revealing himself in the breaking of bread. When Paul was on the ship in this storm, he was with people who didn't believe in the God of Israel. He was with people that didn't believe who Jesus said he was. And Paul told them, don't be discouraged. God visited me in a dream last night and told me that none of us on this ship were going to perish. And he told them that promise that God had given him while they were in the middle of that storm. And as he traveled with these non-believers... God came through on his promise. And when the winds died down and the, the waves ceased, Paul takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it. And what Luke, under inspiration of the Holy Ghost, wants us to see was that Paul was showing these people, demonstrating that the God who protected you, the God that you do not believe in, he is the one whose body was broken for the sins of humanity. Paul revealed who Jesus was in those simple four acts of breaking bread. Can someone say amen? amen? So we see this pattern in the narrative, but we also see a recurring scene. And, and God is trying to get something through to us through the scriptures that if we're not reading carefully and we're not paying attention, we're going to miss. You see, we see Jesus revealing himself in the breaking of bread. But what happens? Where do we break bread? We break bread around a table. And so the, the biblical authors, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, they always use this scene to draw our attention to the table because something important happens at the table. It's a recurring scene. And, 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 and first of all, we see Jesus, one of the greatest points of contention with the religious rulers of his day was the fact that he shared a table with sinners. He shared a table with the unworthy. And this irritated the religious rulers so much because this was a man claiming to be Israel's Messiah. He was claiming to be the Son of God. He was claiming to be the King. But if he really was a King, he would not share a table with sinners. Because only the worthy, the noble, the privileged have a seat at the King's table. You see, Jesus was showing us what his kingdom is all about. So that's why in many of his parables, he says that the kingdom of God is like a banquet. The kingdom of God is like a nobleman who, 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 who threw a party and invited all of his worthy guests, all those who had the pedigree and all those who had the, the status in society to share a table with such a noble person. But you see, this man sent out his invitation and, and all of these worthy people made excuses of why they couldn't come. And so this ruler then, he tells his servants, go out to the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. But, but listen, he said specifically, I want you to get the people that society doesn't want. I want you to get the crippled, the lame. I want you to get the sinners. I want you to get the worst 
of the worst. I want you to get all those people who are disconnected from life-giving and life-supporting systems such as family and nobility and status. I want you to take this invitation to them. And even though they are unworthy to sit at my table, I want them to come and dine with me tonight. You see, because the table, the table, like the kingdom of God, is a place of inclusion. The table, like the kingdom of God, is a place of reconciliation. At the table, those who were once enemies become friends. At the table, those who were unworthy become worthy. Not because of anything they've done, but simply because who invited them. Hallelujah. You ever host a Thanksgiving and you realize that some people aren't there and you're okay with it? (laughs) One thing's for sure, if there's unresolved, even in my crazy family, Okay, I don't have time to share my family story with you, but even in my crazy dysfunctional family, unresolved conflict doesn't show up at the, at the Thanksgiving table because enemies can't share a table together. Because once you pull up that chair and once you join that supper at that table, there's a moment of reconciliation going on. The table is that place where we're included. The table is that place where we become reconciled with God and with one another. So now we see this pattern in the narrative of Scripture. We see this recurring scene in the narrative of Scripture. And this is all built into a practice that the church for centuries has continued. The the tradition of communion or the Lord's Supper. This is a ritual that is built in to the rhythm of the Christian life. No matter what tradition of Christianity one belongs to, we all have in common this practice of communion. It is a command and a commandment in the Bible. But also what it is, it's a way to make the intangible tangible. It is a way to make the unexplainable explained, but not through speech acts, but simply through lived practice. You see, in the practice of communion or the Lord's Supper, what's going on spiritually is that Jesus is inviting those of us who at another time, as Paul wrote, were enemies in our minds. He tells us through communion, through the Lord's Supper, he says, come, take my body and eat. This was my body. This is my body that was broken for you. This is the blood of the new covenant. He says, take and eat even though you were my enemy. Even though you might be en- have enemies among yourselves, this is the place where Jesus invites us to come and be reconciled to him and to one another. Amen. And though we don't deserve his grace and we don't deserve his sacrifice, what he has done for us, we've done nothing to deserve it. It is simply his love for us that calls us to that table, that calls us to that bread. It calls us to that wine and tells us, you may not be worthy, hallelujah, but my body was broken so that your brokenness might be healed. My blood was shed, hallelujah, so that you could receive a new identity, that you could be part of a new bloodline. And in communion, in the, in the Lord's Supper, we, we experience a special presence of God unlike we experience at any other time in our Christian life. And we can't deny this. We can't really explain what happens when we prepare ourselves for the communion service. We take it very seriously. We, 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 we sometimes, we teach that, that we need to understand what we're doing because it's such a serious moment. And what happens is we experience this special presence of God that, that, that it's, it's mysterious in some ways. It's, it, it, it stirs up a lot of emotion. Sometimes we cry, we shout, we weep, we reflect. It's an incredible time and a special presence of God. Amen. Our daughter, Zara, she's eight years old. Just a couple months ago, she received the baptism of the Holy Ghost during a communion service. (laughs) 
I was recently up north in the state of Maine, and I was talking to a family who told me about how during the quarantine shutdown, when they couldn't meet together in their buildings, they were continuing to have virtual church, but he said their family did a communion service together in their house, and their daughter during that moment received a revelation of the oneness of God and understood who Jesus was. Amen. The only explanation we can give as to why this is such a special moment, why communion, the Lord's Supper, is such a powerful part of our lives, the only way we can explain it is that somehow, in some way, Jesus is made known in the breaking of bread. So that Easter Sunday morning, 2017, God initiated a shift as we were planting this church, really we've always, we'd always known we're not just planting a church, but we were opening a region. The vision was to start one church, but really one church at a time. We knew the work that, that lay ahead of us, and sometimes when you think of that, it can feel a little bit overwhelming, especially when you're planting a church for your first time from the ground up with no outside, with, with no availability for church transfers. <laughs> There were no other sheep for us to steal. <laughs> so, so a shift began. After God spoke to me through this verse, and after God told me this is how people were coming to know him, we decided to shift our focus and our, our method of evangelism and to get back to a very basic, almost uh, uh, primal uh, just the uh, method of gathering human beings together. <laughs> Amen. So my wife, she began to make batches and batches of snickerdoodles. Has anybody ever had a snickerdoodle? <laughs> Amen. In Uruguay, the snickerdoodle is a rare, exotic, North American treat because it doesn't exist there. So my wife made these, these snickerdoodles and, and, and packaged them in, in nice packaging, tied a ribbon around it, and we put a church card on it. And we went to every place in the city where we had regular, ongoing communication with people. To the post office, the, 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 the workers who would help us, we gave them cookies. We went to our daughter's school and to her teacher's gave them bags of cookies. We went to the gas station. The people who helped us at that gas station, we gave them cookies. To the person who walked our dog, who watched our dog, when we were out of town, we went and gave him cookies. And to every person we gave these cookies to, we said, as you know, we're pastors. We just want you to know that we're thinking about you, we're praying for you, and please let us know if there's anything else we can pray about. We said, we just want to be a blessing to you. And you see, in this simple act of giving cookies, something began to change. These gifts turned into conversations, and and those conversations eventually began to turn into meaningful conversations. And these meaningful conversations turned into invitations. And before we knew it, almost every week we were receiving people in our house, gathering around our table, sharing bread with us. People from all walks of life. We had business owners, educators, people from the homeless shelter, a refugee family, and everybody in between. We had them around our table at one time or another sharing food with us. And as my wife said, Uruguay Uh, the the majority of people in our church now were ex-atheists and agnostics because a lot of people don't don't know this about Uruguay and it's quite surprising that it's not a religious country. Though it's in South America, it's not a religious country. There are more atheists and agnostics in Uruguay than any other country in Latin America. And And it's a pretty small country. So most of these people that we gave cookies to and told them we're praying for you We want to be a blessing to you. Most of them didn't believe in God. Well, you see that gift opened a door. And as atheists and agnostics began to come to our house and eat with us, I would always say before we eat, 
a custom, this, the custom in our house, and, and, and listen, I, I don't want anyone to be offended. I, I, if you feel uncomfortable, I want you to be okay. You know, you're, you're fine. Uh, we give thanks to God before we eat. We thank him for our food. And, and you, you feel free to join us, participate or not. It doesn't matter. It's fine. We just want you to be comfortable. But we, as, a, as is customary in our home and our family, we're going to thank God for our food. And would you believe, <laughs> we never, one time, out of all the atheists and agnostics that sat at our table, we never once experienced any of them decline to participate. So we had atheists and agnostics around our table thanking God for the food <laughs> that he'd given us. <laughs> you see, people that would never have stepped foot in a church. And at that point, we didn't even have a church for them to come through. We just had our house. But people that would never have walked off the street into a church because they'd already made up their minds what church is about. They've already made up their minds what they think about Jesus. They would never have stepped foot in a church, but they came to our house and they ate at our table. People from all walks of life, lifestyles, backgrounds, life situations, we didn't get them into the doors of the church, but we got them into the doors of our house. You see, because it's, it's not the food in and of itself, and it's, it's, not, it's not even the table in and of itself, but, but what it is is the, the encounter with Jesus that these meals facilitate. Amen. Because Jesus is made known in the breaking of bread. We have to bring people into a situation where bread is being broken and shared. Amen. For Jesus to be able to do his work. You see, the world already has their mind made up about the church. Can someone say amen? You see, there are people who will not walk into our church buildings because they already have made up in their minds that they are not welcome. And Lord, forgive us, some of us good, well-intentioned Christians have given that message, but, but all the others, amen. It's not fair that the mistakes of some should color a whole, a whole population of people, but the sad truth is there are many people who will not walk into the church doors because they already feel that they will be condemned. They already feel as if they are our enemies. So what happens then? If you open up a space for reconciliation in their lives and in your life, what happens if you invite someone to your home to sit at your table and share your food who thinks that you are the enemy? They realize right away, everybody knows. We know it. You can't share a table with an enemy. You can't share a table with someone you're at odds with. Because a table is a place of inclusion. A table is a place of friendship. A table is a place of acceptance. It's not a place, amen, where we say everything is okay with your life. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm saying is like the love of God. We say whosoever will, amen. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But what happens when someone comes to our table having thought before that we were their enemy, suddenly we say, you're not my enemy, you're my friend. Those walls come breaking down. The walls that, 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 that kept the seed of the word of God from penetrating their heart in the past, those suddenly come crashing down. And over the simple exchange of sharing food, amen, God begins to direct conversation. Questions begin to be asked, hallelujah. And Jesus, hallelujah, has an opportunity to reveal himself in a special way to someone who did not know him previously. Because Jesus is made known in the breaking of bread. You see, as I said, it's not the food in itself, it's not the table in itself, but it's the encounter with Jesus that these exchanges facilitate. So what this means is that any place where we break bread in the name of Jesus, that place transforms into a place of encounter. Can someone say amen? The places where we go and share our food and generously invite and give those set 
the, the, that, that sets the tone for the relationship going forward. So you can invite someone to your house, and you can set the table just right. You can bring out all your fancy cookware, and you can cook all the fancy recipes you find on the Food Network that take a million ingredients that aren't available to you. <laughs> you can do your best and you can make it fancy, you can make it nice, you can make it delicious. But if all you do is bring people to your table to eat, all you're doing is hosting. But when you do it in the name of Jesus, and when you do it with intention, it doesn't matter what you serve. It could be a cup of coffee. It could be cheeseburgers from McDonald's. What happens, though, is with intention in, in the name of Jesus, when, when, when before your guests come, you take that oil out and, and, and you anoint that table and you, you anoint every one of those chairs and you anoint the doorposts that they're about to walk in through and you pray the presence of God down in that home and you say, Lord, when they come in, let them feel your presence. When you say, Lord, direct our conversations so these people can know you. Hallelujah. You've gone from hosting a meal to facilitating an encounter with the life giving, life-saving Savior of the world because Jesus is made known in the breaking of bread. Hallelujah. When we share our bread, the place where we are is transformed into a place of encounter. So if you're an attentive neighbor and you find that someone in your neighborhood is going through a difficult time, maybe they've lost a loved one, maybe they've lost a job, it doesn't matter. When you are attentive and you know that there's someone in your neighborhood hurting, all it takes is bringing a casserole, a lasagna, uh, a, 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 a coffee cake, a banana bread, whatever it is, bringing it to their house, knocking on that door and saying, we just want you to know we see you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We just want you to know we understand that you're going through a difficult time. We just want to be a blessing. Here's a meal. This will hopefully make your life a little bit easier this week. What happens is that front porch or that threshold between the porch and the house, that is transformed into the table of the Lord. Hallelujah. Where sinners can come and people can be reconciled. It becomes a place of encounter with Jesus and it gives him the chance to make himself known. You could walk by someone begging on the street and throw some loose change at them. You could even drop off your leftovers from the restaurant you just went to. And all you're doing is contributing to somebody's, uh, uh, somebody's well-being. But when you do it in the name of Jesus. When you walk by that person begging and you give them whatever it is that you give them. And you say, God bless you. I see you. Hallelujah. He sees you. He knows where you are. Something happens. That sidewalk, that street corner, that wall up against the liquor store. Hallelujah. That becomes the table of the Lord where enemies become friends, where the lost become found. It becomes a place where Jesus reveals himself to somebody because he's made known in the breaking of bread. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I want to go back to this passage that we started with. I didn't read the whole passage. It's pretty lengthy. But it's what happened on the road to Emmaus. Two disciples of Jesus had not yet heard the gospel. And that is that Jesus is alive, rose from the dead. The gospel had not reached these people. So they were walking after going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. They're walking back when it's all done, downtrodden, depressed, disappointed. And suddenly, a stranger joins them on the road. Spoiler alert. The stranger was Jesus. All right. <laughs> the stranger comes walking up beside them and asks them, 
Why are you so sad? He said, are you the only stranger here in Jerusalem? Are you the only foreigner around this place? You don't know what's been going on? And they began to tell them why they were so sad. You say, see, Jesus, this, this one that we were following, we'd invested our lives. We were part of this, this revolution that was taking place. We we're following this man, and we thought he was the fulfillment of all of our scriptures. We thought he was the one that was going to come and redeem us. We thought he was the one that was going to judge our enemies and exalt us to the place of honor and privilege that God had always intended for his people, but he's dead. They crucified him. This project we were a part of is done. Our hopes for the future, now we don't know if we're ever going to be able to live to see the Messiah, if there really is such a thing. So Jesus' response was, how could you be so foolish? Don't you know the scriptures? Don't you know how the Messiah was supposed to come, supposed to suffer, and then enter into his glory? And now, I want us to really grab onto this part here, okay? If we don't leave with anything else, I want us to not miss what I'm about to say. From that moment, the Bible says that Jesus opened up their understanding and went from Moses to the prophets, teaching them all they had said about him, about the Messiah. Okay, so we got this, right? Jesus himself, the word made flesh. If there's anyone that has authority and the knowledge and the wisdom to teach a Bible study, it's the word made flesh himself. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you think so? If there's any capable teacher anywhere in the world, in heaven or on earth, it would be the very one who wrote the word. Okay? Are we getting this? So Jesus himself begins to give them a Bible study. Jesus himself begins to preach the word to them. But the Bible says their eyes were holding that they could not know him. But... When Jesus sat at a table with them, when Jesus broke bread and gave it to them, that moment is when they realized who he was. I think some of us might have missed it. I'm sorry if that went over somebody's head. But what I'm simply saying is that sometimes we depend so much on the spoken word that we forget all about the lived word, the word that is lived out in our lives, the word that is lived out in mission with other people. You see, I think someone's understanding what I'm saying now. You see, sometimes we, we, de we depend so much on one or the other, thinking that one is more important than the other, as if words and works, words and deeds are two separate things. They are not two separate things. What Jesus is showing us right here is that words and work, the spoken word and the lived word, are two sides of the same coin. And if your ministry is going to be worth anything, hallelujah, you got to have both sides of that coin. You go try to buy something with a quarter that only has a head side. They're going to give it back to you and say, sorry, this isn't worth anything. Hallelujah. But when you present that money, that coin that has two sides, a head and a tail, hallelujah, they're going to receive it. Why? Because it takes both sides to make a ministry. Hallelujah. Sometimes, church... Sometimes preaching and teaching alone is not enough. Sometimes sharing and giving is not enough. When you host a meal and you don't do it in the word of God, if you don't do it in the name of Jesus with intention, you're just hosting. If you just preach but you put no actions to your words, if you tell people God loves them but you don't show them love, hallelujah, it's not going to amount to anything. 
Hallelujah. We need words with our works because Jesus, the word made flesh, is made known in the breaking of bread. Hallelujah. The Bible says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We read that and we say, praise God. The word of God is more important than food, but there's nothing. We just assume that. But what we can infer from that statement is the opposite. Man can't live by the word of God alone either. You also need to eat. Can someone say amen? You see, we all know that. That's our experience. But when we privilege one over the other, we are missing opportunities to facilitate encounters with Jesus where he makes himself known in the breaking of bread. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, when you learn how to preach, when you go to Bible college and you learn how to preach, they put you in a class and they tell you, how to preach a good sermon, tell you how to preach a bad sermon. And one thing that they always told us was your sermon needs to have one point, one objective. That's what makes a good sermon. So I'm telling you that to say this. Today I'm going to break that rule, and I'm going to present two objectives for this message. Is everyone okay with that? (laughs) So with this word, I want to reach two groups of people. All right, and, and, and if both of these groups respond, then it is for the strengthening of this church and the body of Christ. So the first group I want to reach today are those who maybe feel that the discipleship and the winning the lost and And all that is better left to the ministerial staff. Because, you know, they're the ones that, they're the ones that have the training, the preparation. They're the ones that, that know. They can explain it better. Uh, But, 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 you know, I'm just here, I'm a faithful saint. You know, those who, who understand their limitations. uh, I'm not very eloquent. I can't really... I can't really convince anybody with my words why they should believe in Jesus. I'll just, I'll just bring them to the church and let someone else take care of it. So I want to, I, I want to reach that. If that's you, I want, I want to, I want to encourage you this morning with this. I want to say that it, it, what I'm talking about today, it does not take a ministerial license. It doesn't take a Bible college degree. It doesn't take a certificate from Purpose Institute. It doesn't, it doesn't take any of these things you think you don't have that disqualify you from bringing people into the kingdom of God, from bringing people to the table of the Lord. I want to encourage you that if you have a table at your house and if you had food in your refrigerator and food in your cupboard, you can bring people into the kingdom of God. You can bring them into a place of encounter with Jesus. You don't have to have a long history of experience. You don't have to even be a a, a solid Christian for many years. You could be a brand new Christian. And as long as you have a table, you can facilitate an encounter with Jesus. If you don't have a table in your house, you can sit on the floor. They do that in lots of countries throughout the world. You can sit on the couch. You can go to a park. The important thing is, is that you facilitate that encounter with Jesus through the generous act of breaking bread with someone who needs him. And for those that might be saying, yeah, but I don't cook. We have so many excuses for everything. I want to tell you, you don't have to cook. You don't even have to cook because guess what? There are restaurants and supermarkets and delis all over this city with people who are skilled in cooking. You can go in for a little bit of money. You can purchase something someone else has cooked and you can bring it over to someone's house. If you can be a blessing in someone's life, you can bring someone into the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus did not say, you have to have everything figured out when you bring someone to a meal and then I'll reveal myself. No, it's those simple acts. Taking the bread, blessing the bread, 
breaking the bread and giving the bread. In those four acts, Jesus somehow reveals himself, and we don't even have to understand why. We just have to be obedient to him. We have to be generous and live transformed lives and say, I don't care what these people think. I don't care what their opinions are. I don't care what they think about politics. I don't care who sports team, what sports team they follow. I don't care where they live, where they're from. I don't even care if we can't speak the same language. Hallelujah. They need Jesus. Hallelujah. And this is the way that he has chosen to reveal himself. So I want to encourage this first group of people. You can do it. You can take part in this. And at the end, when we pray, I, I want you to be seeking. Maybe God's dropping names into your mind right now, but, but I want you to, to think about this, reflect. I want this to, to, to turn around inside of you. And I want you to ask yourself, who this week, who can I bless? You see, there's a second group of people as well that I want to, that I want to reach. I want to reach the group of people that continue to stand up against the wall when there's an open seat at the table for you. See, these are the people who Jesus is calling. He's saying, come, take, eat. This is my body which was broken for you. Come and join us. Join my church. Take your seat. But they stand and decline the invitation. Well, I... I I'm not worthy to sit at the table of the Lord. I'm not worthy to be involved. I'm not, I'm not worthy to be part of this that's going on. I'm just content to come and to feel the presence of God every week. I'm just, I'm just content to come and receive the word of God. You see, that's helping me in my life right now. But, but see, I, I, I don't really belong. I don't really fit in the church culture. I don't, I don't really uh, know the language. I don't really know how to, how to worship and to dance just right. I, I, don't, I, I, I know I'm here and I know I'm welcome, but I I don't belong at the table. And for some, it goes even deeper. Some of us even feel unworthy to take our seat at the Lord's table. Some of us have lived lives marked by pain, suffering, tragedy, sin. Some of us have lived lives that that we're ashamed of. And, and, and Jesus is calling us to his table and we're saying, God, I, I'm not worthy. God, I, I don't have it. I don't have it together yet. Maybe in a few years, maybe when I'm a little better, maybe, maybe after I've worked through some of this stuff, then maybe I can start to, to integrate myself. Maybe then I'll take a seat at the table. Maybe then I'll have a place in the church. But I'm telling you, When Jesus shared a table with sinners, it was not because they had already corrected their problems and their issues. He simply invited them to the place of inclusion and reconciliation. Now there's, there's a little story in the Bible, in both Matthew and Mark, that, that speaks exactly to this situation. The Syrophoenician woman, the, or the Canaanite, she comes to Jesus desperate, in desperate need of a miracle. Her daughter was demon-possessed, and so she comes to Jesus. Now, now, understand, she's a Canaanite. She's not in. She's not part of God's people. She is an outsider. And she had the audacity to come to Jesus and ask for a miracle. She said, Jesus, I know that you can heal my daughter. And Jesus shocks us all. If you read this for the first time, it's your first time reading it. You see, Jesus responded in a way, testing her faith. But you see, at the moment, we don't see it like that until we end that little story, but Jesus in that moment when this outsider comes and says, Jesus, will you do a miracle for me? He says, I cannot take the bread that is for the children and cast it to the dogs. In other words, 
What I have is for the in crowd, and you're not in that crowd. You see, in our society, we love dogs, right? We put clothes on them when it's cold, even though they already have a fur coat. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> we were in New York two weeks ago and saw people walking dogs with shoes on. They put shoes on the dogs. We clip their hair, we comb it, we brush it, give them vitamins. We, we, we feed them uh, a, a raw diet. Costs a fortune, but we don't care. It's our dog. They sleep in our bed sometimes. Not my bed. I don't, I don't never have dogs sleep in my bed. <laughs> Let them live in our homes. But you see, this is so different from many other cultures in the world. In many places in the world, dogs are the lowest of low. In the culture that the Bible is set in, the same thing. Dogs were the lowest of the low. It's almost like saying cockroach to us. Rats. So Jesus calls this woman a dog. You see, Jesus was testing her faith and wanted to see if she really understood something about the kingdom of God that we all need to understand. And once she showed that she understood what God's kingdom is all about, he rewarded that faith. You see, she said, she could have been offended and she could have just left, but instead she said, well, I might be a dog, but you know, don't the dogs even eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table? Jesus, in that answer, he knew that she knew that sometimes there's even place, a place for the dogs at the master's table. You might see yourself as a dog. You might see yourself as a bad person. You might consider yourself unworthy of God's blessings and of his grace. You might see the rest of the church, yeah, those are the ones. Those are the ones that belong. Those are the ones that got it. And we might see ourselves as, I'm just a dog. That's you today. I want to reach you. I want to tell you. There's room for you. Even if you are a dog, there's still room for you at the table. I feel God speaking to somebody right now. So I invite you to stand to your feet. In the name of Jesus. There is room at the table this morning. Don't wait. You're standing against the wall. You're looking at what we are all doing here. You're looking at what, what, what the blessings and the, and the grace and the favor of God. And you're saying, I wish I could have that, but I don't deserve it. I'm telling you, there is room at the table. Jesus says, this bread is broken just like my body is broken. And it's broken because you're broken. I understand that. When you come to the table, I know, hallelujah, when I break bread, I know it's because you're broken. And you need my broken body to heal your brokenness. So please come to the table. This is where you're going to find healing. This is where you're, hallelujah, this is where you're going to find what you're looking for. Take your seat this morning, church. Take your seat at the table of the Lord this morning. There's a banquet spread out for you. You don't have to wait any longer. So wherever you feel comfortable, I want you to take the next few moments. I want you to seek after God. If you fall into that first group, maybe you fall into both groups. If that's the case, then praise God. But whichever side of this you land on, I want you to, first of all, I want you to ask God, God, show me those people. Who, who can I lead into your kingdom by the simple act of sharing a meal? God, who is it? Who needs a blessing? God, show me, lead me, direct me. If you're in that other group that doesn't feel worthy of the body of the Lord, the bread of life, 
the table, the banquet, the kingdom. If you're not, if you're one of those people that doesn't feel worthy, you don't feel like you belong, I want, I want to tell you this morning that that is a lie. That is a lie. And that is a lie. There is a place for you this morning. Come and take your seat every hand lifted in this place every eye closed Lord Jesus thank you God for your body that was broken for our healing thank you for bearing God the brunt of human wickedness and evil on the cross God there is no evil that's too big for you no sin so great God you can't overcome it by your resurrection so I pray God this morning that you would free somebody in this place to come to take and eat to sit God pray, God, right now in Jesus' name that you would speak names into our lives of those who you want to reach, those who you're trying to reach, that God, the the preaching and the teaching hasn't gotten to them, but God, maybe the generosity, maybe the hospitality will. God, we are giving you the opportunity to make yourself known in the breaking of bread. So I pray, God, in Jesus' name that for both groups, Lord God, that they would come to a place of encounter with you this morning where they would see and know who you are by gathering around your table. In the name of Jesus.